I was surprised when I went to go make a reservation for Valentine's a little late, uh, which is not uncommon for me, and I had no problem getting a reservation for the time I wanted. There was, I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I was feeling so cool that I set up Valentine's. I can't celebrate tomorrow, Monday, because we have uh, a theater arts program. So we're doing it tonight, and it just worked out so well. Then I realized the Super Bowl's tonight, <laughs> so that's why I set it up. But I, I chose, obviously, <laughs> Valentine over some football game. That's, uh, that's right now. It's just just the type of guy and husband I am. So today we are going to uh, work on a math equation that I believe if we can understand it and work this math equation in our life that we will literally see major breakthrough in our life, like, like life transformation if we can understand and work through this math equation. So, what's that? It's not. It's a little simpler than that. Um, I don't even speak Japanese, so. Um, so. So, before we get there, though, we have to come to that all the way at the end of this is there's a lot of things pre-work we need to do to really be able to do this equation. So um, let me just set some things up and lay some foundation. Um, in life, as you know, we all have circumstances. These are the things that are happening around our life, the things that we cannot control. Some things we can control, some things we can't control. And sometimes our circumstances are like, woo, yeah, things are good. Like everything, you know, it's springtime, 70 degrees, and there's no weeds in your lawn, and your car is working, and you're, you're going on vacation, and, and everything's just working great, right? We like those circumstances. And then on the other end, we, have, we're, we think we're Job, right? Like everything that could go wrong is going wrong that you, um, you just, like, seriously, another thing in the midst of this, right? So... Anyone can relate to both extremes, probably, hopefully at some, I mean, not hopefully that one, but we all, we can all relate. To, and then life is somewhere in between often, right? And, and everything that we try to do in our life is really trying to move everything so that our circumstances are good, like our finances, our, our health, our relationships. We do these things, and, and we kind of create this thing where we're always trying to, to make our circumstances the best they can be. Right? Because we get really discouraged when they're not great circumstances. So something that we can all have. The other thing we need to talk about this morning is, is our emotions. We all have different kind of emotions. Some of you are wired in such a way that, it, that your emotions might be described as a roller coaster. Right? Like, it's like, you're woo, woo, you, you just, you know, day by day. Sometimes when you're up, you're up, and when you're down, you're down, right? And sometimes it goes really fast, and you just, you know, you wake up, and you just don't know what you're going to walk into. It's, it's called being a female. Uh, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, sorry. That just came to me. And there goes Valentine's. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. But, you know, you know what I'm saying? So some of us are wired more that way, our extreme high and extreme lows. Um, some of you are more like the choo-choo train at, um, uh, what's that park here in EHT? Uh, Storybook, Storybook Land. Land, right? Just kind of goes <laughs> a little slow. <laughs> it's just not big change. It just kind of, there's not a lot of change in your emotion. You're just kind of steady and no extreme highs, no extreme, it's just kind of steady. And, and so, uh, and some of your emotions, you, I would say you're more like an extreme sport. You know, skydiving. This is like you're, you're parachuting, and, and you're just getting closer and closer to the ground, and everyone, everyone around you is just really hoping you pull the cord in time before you crash and burn and cause damage, right? So maybe we're a combination of all of these things at different times in our life, but, but everybody here has to carry emotions differently. And, and I think some people have a greater burden when it comes to their emotions, where some might have it easier with their emotions that maybe they don't have to struggle with it just as uh, at the same level. 
So the, some of the things I'm going to be talking about today, I, I just want to make a disclaimer that, that emotions are real, emotions are significant, it's completely wrapped up in, in part of our human nature and, and, and how God's created us with emotion. Um, so emotions, however, can be very dangerous if, if they are the thing that is dictating our life. Right, I think we would un we understand. So, so just because I am angry about something, it doesn't give me a right to do things that would cause damage, or just because you know what I'm saying. So, I think you get that. So, as we go through this, we're going to be looking at life circumstances and our emotions, and then our response to both of those things. And I think it's going to be very practical. And in an unusual way, we're actually in the book of Revelation looking at the seven churches. You're like, well, what does that have to do with circumstances and emotions? It has everything to do with circumstances and emotions because this church that we're going to be looking at in Revelation chapter 2, Smyrna, they were dealing with some extremely difficult circumstances. And anytime someone's dealing with extreme circumstances, they're obviously going to have emotions. But what blows me away is their response to both their circumstances and their emotions. So let's jump into Revelation chapter 2 at verse 8. And Jesus, this is, Jesus is the one, he's saying, John, write this to the church. So Jesus is speaking directly to these people. He says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Who's he talking about there? Himself, right? He's talking about himself. He's, he's establishing, and every time he writes to the church, he always starts off about something about him, which is really important. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for ten days, and you will have tribulation. Your circumstances are going to be difficult, right? Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So we're talking extreme. He goes, be faithful unto death. You can't get more extreme than this. And I want to use this church because I want us to evaluate our own lives and go, when they're talking about these things, the things that we're walking in through and we, that we deal with in our own life, this isn't going to be apples to apples because we're not in a time as a church here in America in this kind of tribulation. But I think we all know what it's like to face things that are difficult that we're struggling with. And I think we can be encouraged by, by the church and their response because he tells them that they are rich. Out of all the churches other than Philadelphia, in all the other churches, he's saying, look, you're doing this right, but here's what I have against you. And we'll get into those later weeks. But here, he doesn't have anything against them. He says, I see you. I see you and what you're walking through. Now, this city, Smyrna, was about, it's a seaport city. It was a very healthy, wealthy city uh, of Asia at that time. It was north of Ephesus. And the, the Smyrna gets its name from, from bitter. It means bitter. And it received that because one of the main products that they had there was myrrh. And myrrh was this like gum-like substance that they would get from a shrub, and then they would turn it into something. So it was this bitter, bitter sh uh, herb type of thing, or resin type of thing. If you, if you ate it, it would be bitter. And um, they would use it, though, and they would make perfumes out of this. And so they would take this, and they make perfumes, and they would be able to make it. They use it for embalming. In fact, it's interesting that when Jesus was born, right, soon after, the wise men come, and what do they bring him? Frankincense and, and myrrh. And then when Jesus dies, and he's buried, and they embalm him, they use Myrrh. So both at his really kind of at his beginning and his end of his, of his humanity, we see this here. And it means bitterness, but then that bitterness is made into a sweet aroma, a fragrance, right? Isn't that kind of cool? Because we look about that, that with Christ, that even though he tasted the bitterness of death, he also, through his death, 
was, the, uh, was an aroma, right? A, a fragrance of something beautiful. We are called the aroma of Christ. And so I just think it's kind of cool as we look at this city that the Christians there, they were facing serious bitter uh, situation. And yet because of their faithfulness and their response, they were aroma to the Lord. Amen. And sometimes in our life, we might be getting things that are bitter, but God has a way of taking those things and making them into a sweet fragrance. So it says that they were facing tribulation. Now, this word tribulation in the Greek um, actually would, would, was where we get the word torture from. And um, it means crushing, debilitating type of tribulation. And it comes from this idea that there was a time that when you were you know, charged with something and, and you were going to be tortured, you were told to, you need to recant of your, of your offense or something, or even your faith sometimes. And so what they would do is they would put weights on the person, right? And they would take those weights and say, you know, are you going to recant? No. Let's just keep adding weight. And they would keep adding, and we could crush them and crush them until eventually they would do it until they died. Like, this is like, he's like, I know the heavy weights that you guys are taking on as a church. And so some of you might feel that way sometimes, right? Or maybe you're in situations where, maybe, not, that, that, not in that physical way, but you guys are carrying weights and these heaviness that you just feels like it keeps getting put on you. And he says, listen, I know your tribulations. He says, I know your poverty. In that time, um, when you worked, you would have to often be part of a guild. A guild would be like our, our day would be like a union, but a lot more extreme. Like if you were in a guild, you didn't find work. And every guild had their own kind of god or their patron god who they pay homage to. So, you know, if you were a metal worker and you, you belonged to this guild and they had a particular god they paid homage to and had these festivals to and prayed to, and you're a Christian and your conscience says, I can't do that. I can't come in and pray to any other God other than Jesus. Well, now you're out of work. And so they were facing this extreme poverty because they couldn't find work anywhere. And they had a belief in the pagan world, especially in the Roman pagan world, that if you were uh, facing poverty, it's because the gods were upset with you or you did something wrong. You didn't have favor with the gods. If you were wealthy, you had favor with the gods. And so here the Christians, Jesus says, look, I see, I see your tribulation, I see your poverty. He says that they were slandered, and in the city there would have been these influential Jewish people, right, that were uh, known in the government, and they, had, and they had influence within the city, and they had position within the city. And these are supposed to be the light unto the Gentiles. These are supposed to be God's people. Yet he calls them a synagogue of Satan. So instead of being the light, they were actually persecuting the Christians, the followers of God. He says, I see the slander that you are facing. And then he says, the devil will put you in prison, right? See, the devil is still very much active and alive in coming against the citizens of the kingdom of God. Do you know that that still is happening today? I want to read you a few verses because you hear that, like, yeah, yeah, I know that. But I just want to remind you that we do have an enemy that is coming against us today. Because sometimes I think what we do is we're trying to battle everything with our logic, right? Like even, I mean, sometimes I'm trying to give too much of my own wisdom and logic, which is helpful. But a lot of times what we need is there's a spiritual warfare happening. It says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. What does that tell us? The devil has schemes that he wants to uh, put towards us. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. James 4.7, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil. You resist something because something is coming against you. In multiple places, Jesus refers to him as the ruler of this world. Paul calls him the God of this world and the prince of the power and of the air. 
John writes, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5, 19. And there's, I can, there's more verses we could bring out, but, but essentially there is one who is scheming against you in your circumstances. So even if you're having good circumstances, he's going to scheme in that situation. How can you take the blessings that God has given you and use it so that you can end up uh, fall into some kind of temptation or, or, or saying no to God and walking away from the Lord, using the good things in your life, the good circumstances, or the bad circumstances in your life and trying to come in and lie to you and deceive you and cause you to, to fall away or struggle even more. So we need to understand that we are in a constant spiritual battle as children of God. He is going to come against us. If you don't believe that, Try doing something for God. You don't believe that? Try to live fully for God. And, and, and tell me that you don't have any struggles against the enemy. You will face that. He says, listen, he says, he didn't say that don't worry about the suffering. It's not going to, it's going to avoid you. He says, no, you know, don't be afraid when the suffering comes towards you. The devil is going to put some of you in prison. And so what sometimes happens in the spiritual realm manifests some way in the physical realm, right? So if the government is under the dominion, really, of the king of the world, Satan, and the prince of darkness, really, he's manipulating situations that actually affect our lives. And this is what was happening to these guys. But Jesus says, do not fear. He says, be faithful unto death. They had such a pursuit of Jesus, an understanding of Jesus, that he can even say to them, do not fear. See, I think that when our life is primarily orchestrated around making our circumstances good and healthy and fun, like in our family, we love traditions and holidays and, and we make a big deal out of it. Right? Like, but if all of our life is around just trying to, the next neat thing in our life, or the next vacation, or the next purchase, or the next promotion, or the next whatever, and, and we're trying to just make everything perfect there, I think when, when that becomes too much of what we do in our life, I think we, there's a disconnect and we miss something in a deeper spiritual realm if that's all we strive for. This church, they didn't really have those opportunities. They were just trying to figure out how to put food on the table. They, they had to fear not having work and not being able to get work and figuring out how to do things. They were facing slander and poverty and tribulation and imprisonment. I think because of that, they were able to see a spiritual realm and a much deeper place than we typically can. I feel like the curtain was pushed back to see, oh, and if you read Revelation, you can continue to, it's so much, all of it's about like what John was seeing in the heavenly realm. He even went to the throne room of God and saw all these amazing things. And so here this church is facing all these things and he says, do not fear. And he tells them, I am the first and the last. And that would be extremely important. Why? Because they could potentially face literal death. And he says, this is what I'll give you. This is your reward, the crown of life. And in the Roman world, they're big into crowns. And you, maybe you've seen a lot of photos and stuff where they would have the uh, little crown, the little wreath, laurel wreath type of thing they would put on them. Usually if you want an athletic event or something or some kind of honor, you, you would get this crown, right? And he says, listen, the crown I'm going to give you is the crown of life. And if you lived in the Roman world, Caesar was God. He thought he was divine, right? And depending on what God they were worshiping, or Zeus or whoever, they were the son of God. Sound familiar? Yeah. Right? And so they were, they were the divine ones. And you wanted, you wanted favor from Caesar. You wanted to be in the most powerful um, government in the world, right? This empire. And he was speaking to them into this very rich and wealthy city in Asia saying, listen, I am the first and last, and I am the one that can give you a crown. Caesar won't even be able to be a street sweeper in the kingdom of God. Where is he now? Where is Rome now? 
I say to you, where is Rome now? I just said, inspired all of a sudden. Uh, it's nowhere, right? It does not exist. But the church does in God's eternal plan and the crown of life that he continues to make available to those who put their trust in him. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Amen. And so sometimes you guys are trying to stand the test that you're going through, but I tell you, man, God's got you. Right? Amen. Then it says, you will not be hurt, hurt by the second death. Now, this second death is mentioned multiple times throughout Revelation, and it's referring to, ultimately, the, the, the lake of fire. Like, there's a first death. I'm, I'm going to face a first death when, when, when I go to be with the Lord, but there's an, a second death that comes after that. This is the eternal death. He says, listen, you will not, because you have the crown of life, that eternal death, separation from God, you will be spared from that. So here is their, here's their resource for why Jesus calls them rich. Here's their strategy. Verse 8, like I said, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Or in the chapter 1, he says it this way at verse 17 and 18. He says, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death in Hades. So for those who literally had to give up their life, how important would it be for you to hear, listen, I've been there. I was dead temporarily, but I am alive forevermore. I have the keys to death in Hades. That is who you're putting your hope in. Continue to persevere, endure. I am ready to give you this crown. Could you imagine? I know it's hard for us to wrap our head around it because we don't live in that circumstance. But this was the reality that this church, and there's churches all over the world right now that still are facing these realities and how much this would have meant to them. If they lost a loved one through persecution or tribulation, how much it would have meant to them to continue to endure. For a father to read this to their child and say, listen, I can't compromise. I might lose my life, but this is the hope I want you to know. Stay the course, even should I get suffering. And these are the things that people had to face. And yet Jesus still calls them rich. John 10, 28, I gave them internal, eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so we see the devil at work, but we also see God at work. And he wanted them to know that he, being the first, had the ultimate authority, not Rome. He has preeminence over everything, including the devil, including the power of Rome. And he wanted his persecuted church to not walk in fear, to not walk in defeat, but walk in victory, knowing who their Savior was. Jesus tells us that, that we would have trouble in this life, but to take heart that he would overcome, right? He overcomes the world. As far as the devil goes, we know his, fin his finality, finality is going to be in the lake of fire where he's destroyed. We know that Jesus is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And sometimes when we hear that idea that there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, it's just hard to wrap our head around. And yet, here we are on a earth as intelligent beings. How did that happen? We're here. Was it just an explosion, random explosion that somehow created all of life? I didn't go, no. So if he did it once, he can do it again. A new heaven and a new earth. Jesus replaces their temporary, our temporary death with permanent life. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And he tells us upon the last days he will raise them up. All right, so we got that part, right? I think you got the idea of eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. I know you hear that every week which is good. I mean, you should have this down by now. 
But again, he calls them rich. Why would he call them rich when they were facing poverty, tribulation, and slander? They had nothing, and he calls them rich. I want to ask you something. Would you rather be, would you rather, that game, would you rather, we'll play it for a second. Would you rather be outwardly rich and inwardly poor? Or would you rather be inwardly rich and outwardly poor? I see plenty of rich, well, not plenty, <laughs> like I, those are my circles or something. I assume there are plenty who are outwardly rich, but inwardly living in poverty. I told you a few weeks, a couple weeks ago, I had a horrible toothache. And it was just the whole few days was just this, uh, do you really think I cared about anything other than that pain I was feeling? For those who are dealing with depression, for those who are dealing with anxiety and stress and all the things, they may have all the riches of the world, but if that inward place is poverty, you have really nothing. And yet there are there's people that have so little, but they are so rich in Christ that if you meet them, they will love on you and they will smile and they will give you their last crumb of bread to serve you. How is that possible? They have a wealth that we only can begin to understand. And it comes because they are centered their life fully in Christ. Amen? Revelations 3.17, talking to another church. He says this. He says, this is the church of Laodicea. He says, you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are rich, wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And then in James 2.5, listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? We are fortunate that, that it's not that we have to live in poverty to be rich in Christ. And that's not what he's trying to say. But I believe what, what even James is trying to refer to is so many times for those you look around, you go, all oh, those who are being so successful in, in, in life, and I, and I don't feel like I have those things. He says, listen, he chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong things because he wants us to understand the most valuable thing we can have is the richness of Christ in us. Man, for you to be able to say, my value is in who I am in Christ. And to believe that and understand that, that's richness. That is treasure. So how do we become continually rich in Christ? And, and, and this, is, this is what I really want to, we're getting to the math problem, guys. Hang in there. This is all setting us up for the math problem. And you're going to write this math problem down, and I want you to take it home. And, and, I, and what you can do is work every situation through it and see if you don't get uh, come out ahead or behind on this math problem. So first of all, we need to understand the word conviction. Everyone say conviction. Just making sure you're awake. Okay, conviction. Here's the definition of conviction. A firmly held belief, the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes or says. Let's do that one again. A firmly held belief, the quality of showing that one is firmly convinced of what one believes or says. Conviction. Do we live out what we preach? Do I come up here on Sunday and preach a message on faith, forgiveness, love, and then turn around and not live it out? Yes, sometimes I do. But then there's this thing called conviction that does not leave me the same. One of the things, sorry, honey, it's Valentine's, so I got to lift you up a little here. When I got married to Carissa, because of who she was, I believed her to be a woman of God who had conviction. And I can manipulate that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but somebody with conviction 
that is directed by Christ, that their conviction is grounded in the word of God through the Holy Spirit and is grounded in the Lord, that's a person I can trust because I know ultimately they're going to come under the conviction of the Lord. And that's ultimately what's going to guide their life. Conviction. Because they firmly are convinced of what they believe or say. I believe that the church in Smyrna, even with their persecution and circumstances and the emotions they would have been feeling and expressing the fear and all the things that came out, that they had a greater conviction that overrode their circumstances and their emotions. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm training for professional sport, like pickleball or something. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's, it's 5 a.m. in the morning, and I know I need to get up to train, but I am tired. My circumstances is this, a comfy bed, and the lights are low, and it's warm, cozy. That's my circumstances. My emotions are, oh, I'm really tired. That's going to equal my response. I'm going to hit the snooze button and go back to sleep. Unless there's a conviction that's stronger that says no. If I'm going to dominate the pickleball world, I need to get up and I need to train. My conviction now overrides my circumstances and my emotions and allows me to get up and train hard and dominate on the court. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of of things not seen. It's this idea that I believe with conviction in the things that I don't even see yet. Or how, and that goes into chapter 11, which is a great chapter of all the people of faith and all the amazing things they did and are willing to do for the sake of Christ. And I think a Christian without conviction will flounder and eventually find themselves drowning in a sea of self-pity, worry, fear, and kingdom ineffectiveness. And I don't say that to be hurtful, because we all have been there in some ways, right? I say that because we are to be set free from these things so that we can walk differently because of our conviction, so that we can be rich in faith, rich in the Lord Jesus Christ, and live differently. Amen? Second Peter 1 says, his divine power has granted us, granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, right, knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature. He's saying partakers of the divine nature. That means we take that on having escaped the corruption of this world because of its sinful desires. And I believe, I, I kind of associate that with, with because of my knowledge of him and the word of God and because I'm in prayer and I believe the Holy Spirit guides me and speaks and leads me that I have convictions that have a divine nature to it that lead my life. So let me give you the math problem. I forgot to have the dry erase board up here, so you'll just have to use my, I think I have a graphic of it. Okay, here it is. Just leave that one there for a second, okay? So a negative number, negative A, times B, a positive, will equal a negative C. I forgot to put a negative there, right? So anytime you multiply a negative by a positive, it equals a negative, okay? Just so in case any of those are not as far along in math as I am. Um, that should be a negative C. Minus D equals E. Oh, thank you. Look at that. He fixed it for me. Nice. Let's give it up for Nathan. Um, minus D equals E. I believe if you can get this right, you're going to be way ahead. <laughs> you're going to have breakthrough. So let's break down the numbers here. Go ahead and show me the letters. Yeah. So we got A, negative A. These are our negative, these are our circumstances. Times our emotions equals our reaction. Minus our convictions equals our response. So let's play that out a little. I, here's my circumstance. A, I just lost my job. That's my, that's my reality that I'm facing. 
times my emotion. What's my emotions probably going to be, right? Woohoo! <laughs> I hate my job. But probably, uh, probably fear, right? I lost my job. That's my story. I'm fearful. I have to provide for my family. This is my reality. I'm going to have an emotional response, right? So that's going to equal my reaction, right? My reaction might be I'm now constantly worried, and in my mind, I start just... I start just thinking about all the things that could go wrong. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose. Chris is not going to like me anymore. I don't know because I'm a loser. And then my kids are going to look down at me. And, I, and you know, everyone's going to like, why did he lose his job? What did he do wrong? All these things are going to start going to my head. Boom, 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 boom. And now I'm worried. And this is my reality. This is my reaction. But I have a conviction. Come on, church. Listen. This is, this is life-changing stuff. I really, really, this is not some cute little sermon illustration. I really believe this with all my heart, and I say this to you as your pastor, as your shepherd that loves you and wants to see you break through. You need to have a conviction that is greater than your circumstances and your emotions. And so my conviction is I am to trust God. And I can go to the Word of God Almost on every page, go through every chapter of the Bible, and the one thing you will see consistently over and over and over is to trust God, that he is a trustworthy God, that I can put my hope in him. We were praying today, and someone brought up the scripture about that, you know, God knows the number of hairs on your head. You know, he knows, he knows if one sparrow falls from the earth, how much more valuable are you? He, sees, he dresses the lilies of the field. Are all the promises of God. My conviction is trust God. So that now equals my response. So my response is I'm going to choose to trust God. I'm going to start looking for work. And I'm not going to start playing all these things in my head that what could happen. I'm not going to listen to those lies. Because who's going to come into those circumstances? The devil, our enemy. You're a loser. What if this happens? Well, this could go wrong. And, and, you know, fear, worry, no. My conviction says that my God is bigger than my circumstances and I'm going to trust him. And you know what begins to happen? Your emotion starts to get in line a little. And it, not always. I get it. Like, there's going to be tough days that you're just, oh, it's really going to struggle. But my conviction is going to override that. Now, you put that in anything in your life. Your temptation those of you who are struggling with some temptation. My circumstance is that I'm really struggling with temptation. My emotions is I really want that thing, and that can equal my reaction into sin, or my conviction is greater, and it overrides that. And I have victory, because my conviction is what's going to lead me. And my convictions are grounded in, first, the Word of God, right? So I'm looking to the Word of God to understand who He is, to understand truth, and I believe the Holy Spirit just guides us in those things. Very rarely, and it, it can happen. There's sometimes situations we're not sure, but, but I, I believe that, that, that we just know when we're in the wrong place. Right? I mean, you really, you can convince yourself sometimes. You can really try to convince yourself when it comes to certain temptations because you want it, and you want to justify it somehow. And so you will convince yourself sometimes. But deep inside, there's this, I think that Holy Spirit check that says, mm-mm, something right about that. I think you know it. And you almost want to hide it, right? You know, it's your own self. And you want to be free of that. Let's, let's use this other person that we've been talking about all morning. Let's use Jesus for this. Let's put him in the equation. Jesus' circumstance, the cross. That's pretty serious. You're going to be 40 lashes hung on a cross. They would have been very familiar with a crucifixion. Crucific Crucifixion. Crucifix is. My worth is in Jesus. My worth is in Jesus, not my pronunciation. Times emotions. I know I even said that wrong. Times his emotions. It says that in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happened? He was sweating blood. He had a lot of emotions. Equals his response. Oh, Lord, take this cup away from me. Father, take this cup away from me but his conviction. I've come to do the will of the Father. And his response was the cross. And his victory was the resurrection. Amen.
See, this doesn't work for Satan because he doesn't have conviction. So he, he's always going to come out negative every time. And so if you kind of do the math, your conviction has to add up to more than your circumstances and your emotions. And I believe you will find victory when you do that. So my encouragement, let me just give you a couple quick verses just to encourage you a little here. John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that you may have peace in this world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. All right? This is part. This is about becoming overcomers. Romans 8, 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 1 John 5, 5. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And so if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, he's given us the crown of life, right? He calls us to all these things. He has eternity, ultimate authority. We're supposed to live as overcomers. And if we're not living as overcomers, maybe our math equation is off. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to be rich in Christ, begin to think through your convictions. What are they on? Do I believe... Do I have a firm belief in the very things I have convictions about? And I recognize in my own life that, that these, this has been an anchor to my soul because I can be a wreck emotionally. I can be such a wreck. I can be so angry at times. I can be so depressed at times. I can be so, you know, we all can. But I'm anchored in conviction that constantly override that. Amen? And so I want to encourage you, if you want to be, you know, be rich, pray like a rich person. Pray with authority. Pray over your situations. You know, go for a walk and declare it. Speak it out in, in, in the spiritual realm. In the name of Jesus, you will not have my marriage. In the name of Jesus, you will not have my child. In the name of Jesus, I will forgive that person. In the name of Jesus, I will not be a jerk. <laughs> you know, in the name of Jesus, I will be victorious. In the name of Jesus, I have worth and I have value. In the name Satan be gone, you have no part of me. This is who I am and I know my identity. In the name of Jesus, amen. When's the last time you prayed that way? Thank you for this food, Lord. Is that your prayer life? Pray like a rich people. The worship team can come up. And live like a spiritually rich person. That means that we walk around with the victor's crown. That means that we look to the word of God and we pray. And we live righteous lives. And when we live righteous lives, it doesn't mean we don't struggle to live righteous lives. There's not many days that go by that I don't struggle to live fully the righteous life I'm called to, to live. But the more I do it, it does get easier. Amen. I hope it's getting easier for some of you, right? And there's some of those same things that keep tripping us up. I, be, I bet all of us could list two or three things. These are the things that keep tricking us up. Start there and say, well, what's my conviction in that area? So I'm going to pray, and we're going to do, I asked them to do, are we good with, still with that song? Um, it is well. It is well with my soul because I am rich here my soul is rich and when our soul is rich and you speak that to your soul that it is well because the peace comes from the God who gives us peace we can be set free and so Lord Jesus I'm asking this morning for us to walk in greater conviction so that our response leads to abundant life that our response leads to us being set free, that our response leads to us honoring you with our life, God. And so we just ask, Lord, even as we use, it, even as we sing this song, we worship, Lord, would you begin to release things in people's life this morning? Hallelujah. Would you release things in people's life this morning? Those who are stuck and stuck and stuck, who have even stopped believing that they can even have breakthrough anymore. In the name of Jesus, we just call out against you Satan that you will have no place here and that this morning that as we sing out from the core of who we are with everything that's in us as we worship you that this would honestly Lord be our battle right now that would take place and that we would see people having victory today in Jesus name